Ladies and gentlemen, we thank you for your continued participation in the Ascension Education Summit. Next up, we have Michelle Gaza, who's going to be going over Uncover Your Internal Self with the Internal Family Systems. Okay. Oh, good. It's working. Before I start, I want to take a moment to just thank Cheryl and all the other people who busted their behinds to make this happen. I am so impressed. I am so touched by the warm welcome that we received. And I just really want to acknowledge, you know, the attention to details. You know, sometimes the spiritual, uh, let's just say, New agers or searchers, we get really caught up in the non-physical because it's interesting, it's exciting, it's mysterious. But the mundane plane is part of being spiritual. And you all handled it. Yes. I feel so good in here. I feel like you laid the foundation for us to come together and I feel relaxed, and I feel so grateful, and I'm so proud of you, Cheryl. It is wonderful. Thank you. So, oh, yep, God is calling. <laughs> so my first question is, I want to know, did anybody here have a perfect childhood? Anybody? Okay, so I'm in the right place. <laughs> So what I'm going to talk about today is how we heal the rifts that are created by the inevitable traumas, conflicts, confusions that happen when we incarnate as a human. So um, I'm going to speak in particular about a system. It's called Internal Family Systems Therapy. It's a very awkward, clunky name. It's not really sexy, <laughs> but it is one of, if not the most powerful system I have found so far for integrating that trauma that we're all experiencing. So the Reverend really warmed it up for us because you were speaking about the energy of this, right? Energies of distortion versus cohesion, right? So those energies, they have faces and personalities and thoughts and ideas. Um, and this is going to be about how we bring those together for healing, right? So my mentor, Richard Schwartz, he started as a family therapist. And in that system, the idea is that everybody in the family gets kind of pushed into a role. You know, you might have the golden child, the black sheep, the martyr, whatever those roles are. And in their approach, if you just get people out of that role so they're not stuck in that role, then everything can heal. So he was finding that this was working fairly well, except he seemed to see that in lots of these families, there would be one child who just wasn't really shifting, like something was going on. And a lot of their approach was about, you change that external relationship, you don't have to go inside as much. But he found that just was not true. And he was working in particular with a lot of young women who um, had eating disorders or were self-harming. So I'm going to tell you the story of how this IFS, Internal Family Systems, was born. So Richard Schwartz, he had a client who was self-harming. She was cutting herself. And so, as you can imagine, she would come to sessions and he would try to get her to stop cutting herself. Because if you have even a little bit of heart, you see another human being harming themselves, you'd want them to stop, right? So he was working, working, and they were always at an impasse, battling, battling, battling. Every session was a struggle. And she'd come back still doing the same thing. So finally one day he had a session with her, and it was his last session of the week. She sat down, he sat down, he said, okay, we're not leaving until you promise to stop doing this. And I think they were there for like three hours going back and forth. And finally, maybe she was just exhausted. She's like, fine, I won't do it. The next week she came back, she had slashed her forehead. She had never cut her face before. And so he sat back and he was like, I'm in trouble here. I don't know what the F I'm doing. 
and this is like serious, this is escalating. So something shifted and he just got honest with her. He's like, I don't know why you do this and I don't know what to do. So instead of this well-intentioned part of him trying to go in and fix her and stop the behavior, which is disturbing, he shifted back into curiosity and openness. So just that shift in energy, it allowed her the space to start talking about, indeed, why does she do this? And what they came to discover is that she was being sexually abused by a family member. She couldn't get out of the situation. So this self-harming was a way for her to cope with that. Because if I'm harming myself, I'm in control. It gives me a physical focus point that takes my attention away from the emotions, the anger, the rage, right? So suddenly now, this part of her that was the enemy became a superhero ally. This part of her that was in charge of cutting her was really in charge of keeping her sane in a situation where, you know, anybody would want to explode, right? No-win situations. And every one of us has found ourselves in these no-win situations. You maybe were born into a family. Maybe it was a lowercase t trauma, and just you and your parents just weren't energetically compatible or they didn't understand you. Or maybe it was uppercase t trauma, and you were living in a nation that was at war, right? Mechanically, all those traumas on that spectrum, they operate the same way. Because what they do is they split us. They fragment our consciousness. Okay, so that's what we're really going to talk about today is how to gather up those pieces of your inner mosaic so that you can become a coherent being again. Back into the zero point of the unconditional love where all the magic happens. So as Richard Schwartz began to work with her and began to see that this part of her was indeed a superhero that was trying to help stabilize her in the best way it knew how, again, in a no-win situation, Finally, that part was able to relax enough and move back so that they could get to the core of where the pain was. Now, in internal family systems, we have labels for these categories of parts, okay? So there's three categories. The first, we call managers. The managers are proactive protectors, right? So they're the ones who say, never again. So I know, um, you know, I was mugged on 8th Street, and my managers are going to make sure I never go anywhere. I don't even think about 8th Street. I don't go to 8th Street. I don't look at pictures of 8th Street, right? It's avoiding getting triggered at all costs. And I'm really first going to talk about these extreme unhealthy versions. Now, the healthy version of a manager, a proactive protector, is getting your laundry done. You know, everybody's managers made sure that they were clean and presentable today, right? You get your rent or mortgage paid. You've got food in the refrigerator. So that's the healthy version. I want to prevent starvation or social embarrassment, so I'm going to handle my business. But when they're unhealthy, they can be very extreme, controlling OCD. Like, it's not just a, enough to wash my clothes one time. I've got to wash them five times, and I've got to wash my hands a million times. Or I have to be very rigid about who I'm around, very inflexible. That's like the unhealthy version. Second category of parts is called firefighters. These are the reactive protectors. So just like firefighters out in the world, if your house is on fire, they're reacting right away. They're running to your house. They got the hose. They're going to put the fire out. But they're not really concerned about social graces. Like, they don't care if your laundry is done. They don't care if they break the vases as they're taking the fire off your house, right? So it's more reactionary. So the idea is with these firefighters is once those inner pains are triggered in you, they step up to put out the flame of the pain. Okay. So when they're unhealthy, this can be extreme things like drug addiction, porn addiction, eating too much, all that sort of stuff. When firefighters are healthy, it's more about uh, like a balanced way of being in the moment, making sure you're social, you have social connections, you're not like uptight working all the time, right? So they're really concerned with being here now and, and having fun and like making some jokes sometimes, right? So that's the range for them. Now, the third category is the one that everybody's afraid of. We call this the exiles, okay? And I have met, I literally have met, <laughs> didn't meet the Dalai Lama, but I met Desmond Tutu. I've met a whole range of these high, famous spiritual people, right? And I guarantee you, everybody has these exiles. 
these are the parts of us which are very similar to what in the you know, popular culture we call inner children. All three of these categories of parts are inner children, as we'll come to discover. But this is more classically what we think of. They're vulnerable, um, they're open, they're fresh. Um, but for pretty much everybody, unless you really know how to do this work or similar types of work, they're holding the pain of the trauma that never got resolved. So let's say in 1982, you had a really mean teacher who was constantly embarrassing you in front of the class, right? If that's not resolved, you have a part of you in 1982 repeating that scenario over, I know you know, <laughs> over and over and over, right? So here you are in, what are we, 2022, and if you think of like a timeline, there's little strings pulling your energy back to 1982, draining, 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 right? So we can turn to pharmaceuticals, but that's just masking the symptoms. There's still this little second grader over here, like, you know, really upset. So these protectors, they really mean well, but the issue is that they don't really know how to deal with that exile. So they're going to do things like using the drugs to numb the pain or with the managers in the proactive sense, really trying to control the environment so nothing comes up in the horizon that's going to trigger that pain from the pain body, right? So in the Freudian model, we have similar scenario, these three parts. You have the superego, which is similar to managers, you know, kind of high ideals, trying to keep things perfect. You have the ego, which is similar to firefighters. And then you have the id, which is similar to exiles. But the problem with the Freudian model is it just has the parts. There's no higher self, there's no God. So all you have is parts, little inner children trying to figure it out, battling. And so unfortunately, that birthed a whole system of therapeutic structures that was really about symptom management and not about actually healing the root of the problem. So the difference with IFS is that Richard Schwartz discovered that even clients who had been extremely traumatized, like war, ritual abuse, all the horrible stuff that we all know has happened and many of us have experienced, what he found is that in spite of all of this, there was a core self that was not traumatized and that was not distorted. And so the real medicine was about bringing these injured parts of us back to that core self. You could call it your inner divinity, your higher self, you know, source consciousness in you. Because once you bring those parts there, some very special things happen. Because number one, the higher self, it's not traumatized. So you can be in the middle of war where you are definitely traumatized, but this aspect of you is calm, clear, patient, not panicking, just chill. Because the higher self remains in the plane of existence where it's always aware we're eternal beings of light, never really born, never really die. All things can be healed. All hearts can be uh, healed. Every problem has a solution, every disease has a cure. So if that's where you live, even the most horrific trauma actually doesn't seem intimidating. But when you're down here, and I'm sure some of you might remember, maybe I remember pre-incarnation raising my hand because I was asked, oh, you want to come and do this crazy mission? And I was like this, and nobody else in the room raised their hand. I was like, am I making a mistake? Because from up there, you're in that unconditional love. It's like, oh, the people, they just need that unconditional love. Oh, so easy, it's so simple. But then you get down here and you get in the feelings and the confusion and the chaos and the projecting and the back and forth and our own shame and blame. It's like, oh, this is no joke, right? And then sometimes like guns and bombs get involved, <laughs> right? It's, it's serious. And even though, the, you know, this is a persistent illusion, um, this illusion has real effects. Like you can damage your soul down here. So the beauty of having this inner divine self who is not traumatized but is still compassionate, right? So it's still connected. It still has um, love for us. It's not condescending, right? Because sometimes I see 
people kind of pretending to be carrying this energy, but you see that they're really judging you. The higher self is not judging you. If, if, I'm, if I'm source, if I'm divinity, and you get angry, it doesn't bother me. If you're crying, it doesn't bother me. If you're suicidally depressed, it doesn't bother me because I'm so much bigger than all of the problems, right? So the issue is, again, what I'm saying, it's so simple, and you're all feeling it and nodding. Okay, it's so simple. So then why is everybody so jacked up, right? Why can't we just, like, pull the cards together and pile them back up and be like, okay, I'm good. The protectors oftentimes don't know about the self or they heard about the self, but they're like, know about this. Or they feel like the self betrayed them. Well, God, where were you when I was getting abused? Where were you when that teacher was embarrassing me? Where were you when I got mugged, right? So there's, there can be confusion because we incarnate here for contrast. Why would source want us to experience contrast? Why wouldn't source want us in perfection, sweet harmony all the time? Well, some beings do stay there, and they don't come down here because it is so dangerous. But the reason a lot of people are lined up to come down here is because when you get in the contrast, it's like going to a gym with the heavy weights. You are going to be so strong. These are not styrofoam weights down here, right? It's so real. So when we're in this contrast, when we experience the pain, the separation, the distortion, the fear, the despair, the hopelessness, we realize what is not source, even though the, paradigm, the paradox is that's also source. But we realize that when we're in alignment with source, we feel good, things go well, things seem to fall into place. When we're not in alignment, things really don't go well. Or if they go well, it's because we have to struggle and push and force, right? So a lot of what I do, I feel like it's like hostage negotiation. <laughs> right? Because even though I'm coming like, hey, I got the light, I got the healing, right? These protector parts, they don't know me. And they probably have had other people come and say that too. Well, I got the light. <laughs> and then something horrible happens. So we, we can also meet healers who mean well, but who re-injure us. So our systems are highly defended. And whilst they are defending us against the bad, it also defends against the good. So a lot of my work is like being a protector whisperer. So helping the protectors understand that this is a safe environment, this is a new day, and there is this interdimensional spiritual technology called your higher self that can heal all of this. And the beautiful thing is that everybody has a higher self. I mean, we could get into a whole tangent about like clones and weird type stuff going on. There, there may be some questionable, <laughs> but... Um, but everybody in this room has a higher self, right? So that means everybody in this room has inside of them perfectly calibrated medicine for whatever ails them, okay? So I'm going to pause. Does anybody have any questions yet before I go forward? Okay, okay. So um, I'm going to talk next about polarities, and I'm just going to use an example for myself because it's a little, that first one was a bit triggering with the self-harming. So I'm going to do something a little bit, more gentle. Many, 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 many years of my life, I struggled with food. And that's a tricky thing to struggle with because unlike, say, alcohol or heroin, you don't need, you don't need them to live. You do need food to live, right? So if you have an unhealthy relationship with food, you can't get away with it. You can't just go cold turkey. So in my courses, I always tell this story, the famous chocolate cake story. So I have this secret recipe for a chocolate cake that is off the chain. It is so good. Kayvon does not like chocolate cake, and he eats this chocolate cake, <laughs> right? So um, I used to make this cake, and I would eat a slice, and then this little voice in me was like, I would just have one more slice. Just, just let's have one more slice. So then I'd eat another slice, and another, and another. These are my firefighters. Something was triggered. The cake makes me numb. It brings sweetness. It brings a sensual pleasure. So I can kind of be here, you know, not really thinking or feeling. And then, you know, sugar does all type of weird stuff. So I would eat this whole cake over the course of like two days. 
and my grandfather died of complications of diabetes. I'm not somebody who can really play with that. So my internal firefighters were just determined. They thought this was a great idea. Let's just eat the cake. It's so delicious, and it's delicious now. We don't have to wait for it to be delicious. We don't have to wait to feel better. It can do it right now. But then my managers would step in talking about, oh, diabetes, getting fat, la, 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 all this stuff. Don't eat the cake. Don't eat the cake. Eat the cake. Don't eat the cake. Eat the cake. Don't eat the cake. I'm sure everybody has been here, right, whatever your cake is. So my managers would get really strong, don't eat the cake, and then my firefighters were like, well, if we just eat all the cake now, there won't be any cake left to cause this problem. And at the time, I'm they were so convincing. I ate the cake. Mm. So this is what we call a polarity. When you have a part of you who wants one thing and another part of you who wants the polar opposite, what do you do? How do you deal with this rift in your family? One child wants to go to soccer, the other child wants to go to ballet. Where do you go? So the way that we deal with these polarities is bringing both sides to the higher self. Right? So in this case, both of these were protectors. My managers were the protectors that were trying to protect me from lack of health, you know, lack of feeling good in my body, and all the despair that that causes. But my firefighters were trying to protect me from this deeper pain that was triggered, and in this case it had all to do with my mom, um, that was just unresolved, that I couldn't resolve. So the work then, when you find yourself in these polarities, is to help those protectors feel comfortable, and one of the ways we do that is by introducing them to the higher self. So then what they learn is that this job I was taking as this human part trying to play God, I don't actually have to do that to feel safe because there actually is God in me that can handle that. And so a lot of times what you have to do is just expose and connect these parts to that divinity so they can see it for themselves. Because again, my words are just words. I never ask anybody to take my word for anything. I offer experiences so you can see it for yourself, right? So once you help these protectors relax and feel safe, now with some people that's 10 minutes, with some people that's 10 sessions, you know, depending on where they're at in their journey. Once you help them to feel safe, you can get down to that lower level in a lot of cases, it's like a dungeon in your consciousness where all these exiles are sitting. Again, like that example, swirling around 1982 and the trauma of that mean teacher. I don't know how some people are allowed to be teachers the way that they treat children, right? The impact that it has on these little vulnerable beings. So once the protectors relax and feel safe, you can go back to that memory. And what you're basically doing is scooping that little child up, bringing it to present time, and reconnecting it with the self. So we're talking about time travel. We're talking about changing the past. We're talking about healing stuff that you think was over and done with, but then it comes up, sh shocking, surprise, I'm still here, right? So that's what we're gonna, um, we're gonna do in a few minutes. We're gonna have an experience of this. So when we get to the exiles, um, the thing that surprises me to this day <laughs> And I have worked, I've literally heard it all. Like I've worked with people who've survived satanic ritual abuse. I have worked with people who are veterans who were in combat. I've worked with people who they had to divorce a crazy narcissist who like took all their money and abused their children. They couldn't get their children back. All this type of stuff, right? Rough things. And once you help the protectors relax, once you bring that energy of self to the protectors so they feel like, I'm seen, I'm heard, I'm understood, I'm not being judged, right? So in my example, once I say to my firefighters, I know that you're actually trying to help me, you're trying to stabilize me emotionally, right? But do you really like doing this job? Like, do you like making me unhealthy and overweight and having stiff joints because of all the sugar? And if you really, really listen, they don't like doing it. I mean, the average alcoholic, they don't actually like drinking alcohol. <laughs> That's the crazy thing. The firefighters are doing it because they feel they have no other choice. If I don't drink this 15th beer, 
I'm going to feel those feelings, and those feelings are going to kill me. And that's really what the belief is in most people. If I feel that, I'm going to die. Because the initial impact of a lot of these things, in most cases, happen during childhood, especially those first early years. Is it on? Oh. At the time, it did feel like you were going to die because you were so little and vulnerable. So the belief is if I go back there, it's going to be just as bad. I'm going to be overwhelmed. So what we want to do as that first step is to help these managers and firefighters, these protectors, get recognized and seen. Like, I see you. I see what you're trying to do. I wonder how it feels to be you. Like, how does it feel to be an uptight manager where, like, you can never relax until all the laundry's done and there's not a single drop of dust in the house and all the bills are paid and you have 300000 in savings in the bank or you can't relax? How does that feel? Well, it sucks, but if I don't act like this, we're going to feel those feelings and we're going to die, right? So like with managers, you can have these socially acceptable addictions like being a workaholic, making lots of money, all these things that society actually is okay with, even though it's just as destructive as the alcoholism and the self-harming and all this. We help these protectors to be seen, heard, and recognized. And the beauty of bringing that higher self presence is that the higher self, it doesn't have an agenda. Again, because if you know you're divine, everyone else is divine, everybody's another self, there's divinity in front of me, behind me, above me, below me, beside me, what do I have to worry about? So I don't have to have an agenda. If somebody walks in here in a rage, huh, I wonder what's going on with them. And I don't have to panic because whatever's going on with them, I can deal with it. It can be integrated, it can be healed, it can be fixed, so I don't have to be triggered by it. So our protectors are used to being judged, corrected, punished. So when you bring the light of self to them and they feel like, oh, you understand me. You understand that I'm making her cut herself because if she doesn't do that, she's going to probably go shoot her uncle that's abusing her, right? That's the alternative, right? And, and it really is that serious in a lot of these situations. Then I see, oh, this cutting part is actually a hero doing a dirty job in a no-win situation. And once these parts feel seen, heard, recognized, understood, then they're like, oh, me and, me and the facilitator, we're allies now. You see me, you, you get me, you get me, right? And that feels good. So then they can really be real and release what they're feeling, experiencing. They can be authentic. And to be witnessed in authenticity, I mean, you, you touched upon this as well, people feel like they can't be real. So when you bring this higher self energy, it changes the morphogenetic field. And these parts can come forward and be real about what's happening with them. So instead of us having this cycle of things either getting repressed or exploding, we come to this place where you can ironically, have your cake and eat it too. You can express your emotions without the world ending, right? So even if I'm like, let's say I'm in a jealous rage, I come to the higher self with this energy, and it just releases, expresses, dissolves, integrates. And it's really that simple. It's just an energetic wave that we can just allow to process without judgment. And it just simply amazes me how easy it can be once we have established this foundation of safety and respect. So once the protectors feel safe and we move down to the pain of the exiles, we scoop them up and bring them to the present, and then we give them the same medicine. How did it feel to be in second grade with that mean teacher? You know, how did it feel when you got attacked? How did it feel when you get mugged? What, what was that like for you? And just really listening without cutting them off, without telling them how they should feel, right? A lot of times manager parts will step in when, you, when an exile comes forward and is talking about, say, like, my dad was abusive. The manager will, will want to, like, adultify them. Well, you know he was doing his best. Maybe he was. Just as a side note, I don't really like this term, oh, people are doing their best. Sometimes we're doing our best. Sometimes somebody's got an entity working through them and no, they are not doing their best. That's not their best. Doing our best is our higher self integrated and driving the car. Having our frightened two-year-old driving the car or our pissed off inner 14-year-old driving the car, that's not doing our best. 
That doesn't mean we're bad people, but by definition, our best is a divine alignment. So there's this confusion that happens because we tell children, oh, your parents were doing their best. No, your parents were jacked up. They might not be bad people. They were wounded. They were confused. They were sick. And it's important to make this distinction so that children get that validation. No, that's not the best. That's not the best that humans have to offer. That wasn't in alignment. And we're not doing that to throw your parents under the bus. We're doing that for the discernment. It didn't feel good because they weren't doing their best. But the beautiful thing is that now, whatever you didn't get as that child, the higher self can bring the best, right? So we can have what's called a corrective emotional experience if we can get the managers to step back and stop correcting the inner child. And we do this. I mean, when I became a stepmom, I started to see the patterns coming through me, and Junior would do stuff, and I saw these patterns, and I was like, okay, wait. I know how it felt when adults said that to me, so how can I do differently? And I, I'm not perfect, you know, as a parent, but we do our, you know, we do what we can to get more into alignment. And when we mess up, we apologize. We explain to the children, hey, I wasn't doing my best. When I snapped on you, I wasn't doing my best. I was tired and I was hungry and me and your dad just had an argument. So it's not you. So, okay. Before we go in, any other questions? Any comments, questions? Okay. Let me just turn this. Yes. Yes. So get comfortable. Um, okay. So we've just had a beautiful time connecting here, more kind of mentally. The heart field is open as well. So I'd like to invite everybody, if you feel comfortable, to close your eyes. And sometimes you don't feel comfortable doing that, and that's okay. If that's the case, just find something pleasant to gaze at, and you just use that gazing point to focus you. So we're going to shift our awareness now more from kind of a mental learning, intellectual learning of the model. Now we're going to shift our focus down into the body, dropping the awareness down, down, down. See if you can get all the way to the soles of your feet. And if you can't feel your feet, wiggle your toes, move your feet around, circle your ankles to anchor consciousness there. And as we do this exercise, if there's any part of the body that feels numb or that you can't connect to, feel free to move it or place your hands on it. Okay, Vaughn really dropped a code on me um, a little while ago about how the hands are like microphones. So placing the hand on, say, your knee kind of gives your knee the mic. So I'm going to go into silence for a moment, only for about two minutes. And during that time, I invite you to really keep your consciousness dropped into the physical body. So your internal system, your managers, firefighters, and exiles just heard everything I said. And what happens when we first get exposed to the model is you start to see a line of parts inside of you with their hands up. Pick me, talk to me, pick me, talk to me. So I'm going to go into silence in a moment so that you can listen to and connect with those parts of you. Now, you can show up as thoughts, feelings, and physical sensations, emotions. Some people are very visual. Some people are not. Could get memory flashbacks. Or you may have a manager come forward who wants to keep you kind of numb, and that manager may be talking about the, you know, the groceries that you didn't buy, or how you got to get the oil changed on the car. So I'm going to invite you to just notice all of this without judging it. And at this point in the process, we're not trying to fix or change any of it. We're just observing. So I know people aren't really going to movie theaters a lot these days, but remember the last time you went to the movies and you just sit back in the chair in the theater to observe. So it's a similar type of energy, but you're sitting back in your chair to observe you on the inside, all your little internal parts. Okay, so I'm going to go into silence, and in about two minutes, I'm going to check in with you. So keep your breath nice and slow to help regulate the nervous system and slow down your brain waves. 
keep that consciousness drop down into the body as best you can. Just take a few seconds to just kind of review what you noticed. Just kind of take some mental notes. Okay. Does anybody want to share anything that they noticed? Okay, Vaughn. I know. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. I love the, the stage curtain thing, too, because a lot of times um, when I work with clients, I use the metaphor of like an open mic. So, you know, you got a spotlight, bottle of water, a microphone, and we're inviting these parts to come forward to be seen and heard and understood. So, um, yeah, so I would like to take some more steps so that you all can experience this, you know, like Kayvon is talking about, how to link your parts up to the self. Um, so let's actually, is there anybody who didn't feel anything during the meditation? Okay. Yeah, and 
it's very common when we find ourselves in these groups that you have parallel parts. And uh, in a lot of the trainings I did, you'd get broken down to work in groups of two, and you'd end up with somebody with all these parallels with you, because, you know, that's just how it works. And what was your experience? Yeah, so it's important to know sometimes it won't be visual. So it can be sounds, memories, thoughts. Your knee can start tingling. That's a part, you know? Yes. Yes, thank you. And that's important to understand because some of our parts are very verbal. Some of them can show up visually. Kayvon also has a very visual brain. Not all of us have very visual brains. I don't. My work, when, when I don't see like a movie, but I can describe it to you like a movie because it's like I've read the novel. I just get the knowing download. Whereas some people it's very visual. Some people it's very auditory. So just know that so that you're not judging yourself. Because I want everyone to know this isn't a cookie cutter experience where everyone's going to have it go the same way. Second, Sometimes, you know, I'm not sure how you're related to everyone here, but, you know, it's a, a new group of people. You don't know me. We've never done this before. So the system can... C oh, okay. And so that can be an issue. So, and that's really important to know and to honor because some people thrive healing in a group and some people don't. There's some people who work with me, they only will do one-on-one. -on -one. They don't want to do group stuff. And there's some people who live for the group. So again, just honoring. If what you need for safety is to work one-on-one, -on -one, then that's what you need. You know, sometimes I've seen people bring stuff to a group healing that's really big, and it was so big they felt like they couldn't do it unless there was a bunch of other beings holding the energy down, you know? But then sometimes there's something really big and it has the opposite effect. They're like, this is so big, I don't want to do this in front of other people. And everybody's different. Okay, so being really careful to honor your own experience. And it's a whole range. It could get very weird. It could be very mundane. But just to honor what's coming up. Another thing that comes up sometimes is like, you'll see or hear or experience something weird and you're like, well, I'm just making this up. Okay, let's say you are making it up. If you are making it up, why is it that particular content, though? Like, if you're making up a little boy in a Batman costume running around, why that? Why aren't you seeing, like, a guy on a horse or somebody playing baseball? Why is it that particular content? Because sometimes our managers, because they're afraid, managers like to know in advance what's going on. They want the itinerary. They want it on time. They're, like, very German, you know, <laughs> on time. So this starts to divert from the plan, from the agenda. It's like, whoa, you're going into some feelings here. I don't really do feelings, right? Managers, even when they're healthy, they're not really the feely, feely people inside of us. So sometimes that can shut us down just because this can go really deep, really fast, and it feels destabilizing. So it can numb us out, right? Even in one-on-one -on -one sessions. So what I'd like to do now, actually, so you kind of warmed up doing that meditation, but let's just take another moment and just consider an issue that plagues you. And it could be something real gentle, or if you feel comfortable, go a bit deeper. So Kayvon offered this. I have this issue that whenever I'm getting ready to present, I have this belief, like, I got to be so Hollywood, and, you know, am I going to, like make the mark and all those sort of things, right? So that could be the one that he's working on. You know, the issue could be um, my spouse is triggering the heck out of me and we're caught in this cycle I don't know how to get out of. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Many people can relate. Yeah. So just kind of take a moment and feel it. What's, what's the thing that, like, if you could shift it and heal it, it would make a difference in your life, whether it's a little difference or a big difference. So I'm just going to be quiet for a moment and just kind of find what that thing is. Like what's coming up for me now is like this weird relationship I've developed with exercising and self-care and like the blocks I have around that so that I'm feeling that right now.
anybody not have any problems? Okay. <laughs> so in this exercise now, you're going to invite any part or parts of you related to this problem to go in this magic healing room. Okay, so again, some of us are very visual, some of us are not. So if you're not visual, just imagine this healing room. Imagine what it smells like. What does it feel like in there? It might feel very much like this room. You know, calm, safe, secure. Maybe it's quiet for you. Maybe you need music in your healing room. So we're just going to set the stage internally. Imagine this beautiful space, inviting and safe. And then you're going to place any part or parts of you that are part of this pattern or issue that you can't fix in the room. So I'll give you a moment to do that. And again, remember, you may see them, you may hear them, you might just feel them, you may feel like your stomach drop, you might feel your solar plexus start to churn, your heart may be racing, or you might feel like dejected and lethargic, but just notice. And now you're going to actually sit outside the room. So there's a door, and then there's a window pane with one-way glass. So you're sitting on a bench looking through to this part or these parts of you. So you can see them, but they can't see you. And so now we're going to kind of internally investigate if we have a polarity. All right, so for example, I have a part of me that's resisting exercise and self-care who's sitting in the room. And as I sit on the bench, I notice a part of me who's pissed off at that part. Why are you blocking us from getting healthier? So just start to notice, do you have any parts of you that feel some type of way about the part inside the room? If your chocolate cake eating part is inside of the room, the part that fears getting diabetes might be sitting on the bench next to you. If you need to confront something with your spouse, right? maybe the part of you that doesn't like confrontation is in the room, and the part of you that just wants to chop their head off is sitting on the bench with you, or vice versa. So just take a moment now and get to know the parts of you on the bench. How do they feel about this target part inside the room? How does that target part inside the room affect them? So part of what this exercise is about is called unblending. So the issue that happens is that we tend to, f to blend with these parts. So you might have a part in the room who's got extreme rage towards your spouse. But you know if you blend with that rage and just snap on them, probably they're not going to be so receptive and things will escalate. But at the same time, that rage is there for a reason. So what do you do? Then maybe you have a part on the bench who's like, well, let's just pretend we're not mad. Well, that's not really the answer either, right? Because the anger's not going anywhere. We are a closed internal system. So the angry part, it can't leave. It's a part of you. Right? So this is one of these situations where the only way out is through. But I don't want to feel that anger. I'm afraid if I let that anger come into my body, it's going to just burn everything. Right? But then if I blend with this part on the bench who wants to just be fake, well, that's not really authentic, and that's not really going to get to the heart of things either. Okay. The 
before we take the next step, is anybody stuck or needing help? Okay, okay, beautiful. And it can bring up emotions. This can be very, very triggering. It can be very tender stuff that's coming up and just know you don't have to share if you're not comfortable. So this can all be private and internal. So we're gonna take the next step now of anchoring in the higher self to bring that medicine to these parts of us. And when it comes to this point of the process, I like to remind everybody, again, everybody has a higher self. You don't have to be like Eckhart Tolle's best friend or hang out with Lao Tzu or know Jesus and Buddha personally, like they're in your living room all the time. <laughs> you still have a higher self, even if Oprah is not trying to interview you for her spiritual podcast. So everybody has this. So this is just a matter of relaxing and allowing what's already there at the core of your being, just surrendering to what you already are, which is divine. So we're gonna do this meditation. There's four rounds of just focusing on different qualities of the higher self and inviting those qualities to really spread throughout the physical vessel and anchor in to this plane. So slowing down the breath. Inhaling, we're gonna focus on compassion and connection. So if I know that everyone is another self, and if I know I'm an eternal being of light, everyone is another me, I can be compassionate and feel connected without any effort. The higher self rests, the home of the higher self is in the unified field of consciousness. So there, there's no separation at all. Separation is impossible. The higher self recognizes we're having a very persistent illusion of separation that is real in this plane in that sense, right? So the, the tea that I drank this morning, it didn't warm up your bellies because there's that type of separation even though behind the veil of this holodeck, we are all source. And when we tap back into this knowing, it's easy to feel this unconditional love, compassion, and connection. So on our next exhale, we're gonna release this compassionate connection into the world around us. Okay, second round, we're go going to focus on calm clarity. I'm an eternal immortal being. Divinity is all around me. Never really born, never really die. And even though I witness my human form trauma, I'm not actually traumatized. This is the higher self perspective. So it's effortless for the higher self to be calm clear and totally anchored in the eternal now moment. So tap into that still, calm clarity that's already there at the center of your being. And invite your cells to surrender to this calm clarity. And on our next exhale, we'll release calmness and clarity into the world around us. Third round, we're gonna focus on courage and confidence. So I find this aspect of the self very interesting because the courage and confidence of the higher self can seem downright crazy to our traumatized human parts. How can you be so courageous and confident when the world is in the state that's, that it's in? When there is perils and danger down here in this realm, how can I be courageous and confident when humans are doing horrible things to one another? 
But for the higher self who remembers, this is a stage, this is a theater, and we're actors playing parts. Now, this play that we're in, it has very real consequences. The feelings are real. The experiences have real um, effects on our being, on our energy body. But it's just a play. It's just a video game that we're experiencing. And the true identity of who we are is these eternal beings of light. We're just actors playing parts. And at the end of the play, we go home and we still exist. And then again, if I know divinity is everywhere, inside of me, in front of me, behind me, below me, above me, beside me, what do I really have to be afraid of? If I know, I don't have faith, I don't have a belief, I know that even the most deranged sociopath is also source, just a very, very extremely distorted version who's disconnected. Now it's not so scary. And when I realize, and this can be a difficult one <laughs> to accept, even that crazy deranged sociopath is on some level a part of me, now the fear goes down even more. Because if it's a part of me, that means I'm not powerless. So we're going to lean into this courageous confidence of the self. It's expansive and empowering, but it's not about an inflated ego. This courage and confidence isn't about belittling other people. This courage and confidence comes from a level where everybody can win at the same time. So tap into that feeling where victory is assured. And on our next level, we're going to release this courage and confidence into the world around us. Okay, final round. We're going to focus on curiosity and creativity. So this exciting aspect of the higher self, curiosity, is so special because it brings the energy of allowing. It's the opposite of having an agenda. And because it's an allowing that's backed up by courageous confidence, it creates space for all of our parts to come as they are so that they're all actually welcome. So anger can come, temper tantrums can come, Terror, fear, hopelessness, sadness, jealousy, confusion, envy, all of it can come to the feet of the self without being judged, without being condemned, without being pushed away. Instead, there's this open curiosity where I can let down my defenses because I know I'm not going to get judged or attacked and I can just be real. I can finally be real. I can release that block in my throat chakra. I can release the blocks in my heart, the blocks in my emotions, just let it out. And the interesting thing is, when we get into this space, the stuff that was so scary and so big, it's actually nowhere near as big and scary as we thought it was when it's in this field of no resistance to what is. So when we tap into this curiosity, we also tap into divine creativity. This is the level of consciousness where every disease has a cure. Every heart that's broken can be healed. Every problem has a solution. So we're inviting this level of our consciousness. It's already there. It's who we already are. So we're just inviting that to expand in our body, help ourselves relax, feel excitement, that creative excitement, the curiosity of what's possible. And on our next exhale, we're going to release this curiosity and creativity into the world around us. Feel the thickness of the now moment that we are 
dropped into together. The peace, the stillness, the ease, the grace. Now the next step is you are going to be the embodiment of these energies. You are going to embody the higher self and approach these parts of you to give them this medicine. Just a moment before we do that, is there anybody who had a hard time anchoring in this self energy? Anybody feeling any blocks or? Okay, yeah, it can really help to do it in a group because together we just, oof, it's like juicy and thick. So you're gonna embody the self. This means you're being the self. You are the eyes, nose, mouth, hands of the self. So you cannot see yourself because you're being the self. First step, I'd like you to turn to the parts of you on the bench who are triggered by the target part in the room. And first I want you to ask them, do you feel like I really get it? Do you feel like I really understand you? I understand why you're triggered by this part in the room. And just see what they say. So for the next step, let this part or these parts on the bench know that you're about to go into the room to work with this target part. Now the parts of you on the bench can stay on the bench or they can go in with you. It's really up to them, but the higher self is leading this process. Right, so what we're doing right now is called unblending. We're separating from these different human parts of us, different aspects of us so that we can see them and so that we can heal them with this energy of the self. So we want to be clear that we want to go into the room with this self energy of unconditional love and non-judgment. So if there's any part of you that's not feeling that, they can just stay on the bench and watch. And they're allowed to feel how they feel. It's understandable. Probably they've already told you exactly why. Or if they feel ready, to be a tiny bit softer, they can go in the room with you. So if you feel ready, go ahead and touch the doorknob. Sometimes parts on the bench are like, don't go in there, <laughs> right? So just reassure them. We're just gonna go in for a few minutes. We're gonna go in a very controlled, gentle manner. So go ahead and open the door and go into the room. Maybe you're just going as the self. Maybe the parts are going with you. And just start by sitting across from that target part. And we're just going to start without speech. Just notice this part of you, the target part. And with every exhale, send it a wave of compassion. Let it feel your connection, your curiosity, your lack of judgment. Let it feel your calm, clear courage. And also let it feel that playful, creative spark you got in your pocket. Let it feel that hopefulness. And now for the next step, I want you to be very gentle and very respectful. See if this part of you in the room will allow you to make physical contact. If they are not ready, do not force it. They might have already jumped into your lap, who knows. But if they haven't made physical connection yet, see if they will allow you to do that. Might be just holding their hand, putting your arm around this part, giving it a hug. If it's a little baby part or a child, they might want you to pick them up or hold them or cradle them. Sometimes little infant parts, we need to hold them, rock them, soothe them. now asking this part as well, do you feel like I get it? Do you feel like I really understand what's happening for you? Do you feel like I understand what it's like to be you? Am 
might be some tears. There might be anger. There might be numbness. All of that is welcome here. Before we take the next step, raise your hand if anybody still doesn't understand the part. You're still not clear on what the part is showing you. Okay. So now I want you to ask this part, do you feel open to doing a healing ceremony today to release this suffering, to release this pattern that you're holding? Sometimes the parts aren't ready. Sometimes they're already moving, <laughs> they're ready, they've been ready. So just see how this part of you feels and there's no right or wrong. Some parts, they need several steps before they're ready to release that. They may, may need a lengthier session with you. They might have more memories they have to show you. Some parts are ready to go. If your part is not ready, then I invite you to stay in the room with the part and the work is to just continue to shower this part with the unconditional love the patience, the calm connection. But if this part of you said yes to the healing, then we're gonna offer a ceremony using the elements. So in this ceremony, this part of you is gonna be invited to wrap up all this traumatic stuff, the yucky feelings, whatever sort of heaviness, whatever electric charge is stuck surrounding the trauma, the confusion that they hold and we're gonna wrap it up in a bundle and release it to the element or elements of their choice. So water, wind, fire, earth, wood, metal. Sometimes parts like to just release it to the central light of source. Sometimes parts wanna invite in your angels, trusted benevolent ancestors, particular gods or goddesses that you work with, spirit guides, creator beings, Jesus, Buddha, Mary, Allah, whomever works with you, whomever you experience as a safe place, if that feels necessary, invite them in. And we want to make it very clear to this part, we are not trying to get rid of the part, we're just getting rid of the stuff that's not serving anymore. And it's okay to release this baggage because you've already mastered the experience of having it. You already know what it feels like to be fed up, tired, exhausted, angry, furious, sad, suicidal, confused. You already know how that feels. You have an A plus in that experience. So it's okay to release it. And it's also okay to release it to the elements. There's no negative karmic repercussion. It's more like if you took rancid food from the back of the fridge and threw it in the compost heap, the earth just takes it, alchemizes it, the earthworms chew it up, next thing you know you got an apple tree and a rose bush. So in fact the elements love when we do this healing with them because when we are not healed, when we are suffering, the elements suffer. Our air is polluted because our minds are polluted. Our waterways are polluted because our emotions are polluted. The earth is polluted because our bodies are polluted and so forth. Okay, so the elements rejoice when we do this work. So just take a moment and ask this part of you what element they would like to use and what form of the element. And oftentimes they'll need to use multiple ones. I want you to totally trust this part of you because believe me, they come up with stuff that you're, you would never have thought of. They come up with the most ingenious ways to use these elements. So just take a moment to listen and we'll begin in a second. And if it's not exactly, you know, like some cookie cutter version, like my part wants to do earth, but she wants to use a punching bag to symbolize earth. So that's okay. It doesn't have to be that she's like taking a mud bath or something, but you may have a part that needs to take a mud bath. So for the next step, we're gonna remain anchoring the higher self in our body. 
And all of us are just going to be witnessing this part of us releasing the crap that they're done with. So go ahead and invite this part of you to begin the ceremony. And you are just holding space, the golden light of source embodied, giving protection and compassion as this part of you begins the ceremony. Maybe they're burning your rage in a bonfire. Maybe they're releasing trauma into the river. Maybe they're releasing their confusion to the ethers and the air and wind. So just take your time and support this part of you to release. Okay, we'll take another moment or so to complete the ceremony. And if your part needs more time, you just keep going and just ignore my voice. And if you're not sure, you can just ask the part, do you feel complete? And they may decide they need to use one more element or they may be complete. So just investigate where you're at. really encourage them to let every last drop of that distorted, heavy, yucky stuff release. The elements can take it all. Okay. So now this part of you has released this junk, this gunk. Possibly for the first time ever, this part of you has a free will choice to take on a different type of energy. So sometimes a shy part may want to take a public speaking course or a theater course. Sometimes a part that was afraid to be an artist may want to start painting. Sometimes a part that was not wanting to exercise at all, is now willing to do exercise in a way that's really authentic and appropriate for you and your energy in the moment. You know, not what somebody on the TV says we should be doing for exercise, but what you really need. So sometimes a part can have a total flip and go to the opposite of its old job. And now what this part of you may want to do, it might not be 3D. So if this part says, I want to play basketball with leprechauns or I want to go ride a unicorn down a rainbow, that is A-OK. -okay. Encourage it, listen, support. Is there anybody still not clear on where the part wants to go or what it wants to do? Okay. Okay. 
then the final question is seal the deal. And I want you to really slow down and listen. And there's no right or wrong answer. But you as the higher self ask this part of you, do you feel confident that you can connect with me, the higher self, anytime you need to? Now, if they say yes, your only homework is to celebrate the healing. If they say no, or I'm not sure, or is anything other than a confident yes, I want you to take a moment right now to negotiate a check-in time with this part. So if you commute to work, maybe your commuting time is when you listen to this part. And the good thing is now with phones in the car, you can be talking to yourself in the car and nobody around you will notice, so that'll be fine. <laughs> or maybe it's every time you shower, that's your time. Maybe you're journaling, that's the time you connect in. Maybe you're somebody who likes to go for walks. Maybe it's in the bath. So just find a very practical way to connect with this part. And it needs to be something you can follow through with. So if you make a new friend, let's say we become friends and we agree to meet for coffee next Tuesday at 9 o'clock and I don't show up, you're not going to feel very confident in this friendship. right? So make sure that if you agree to meet with this part 9 a.m. Tuesday for coffee that you can actually do that. So in other words, you're probably not going to be checking in every five minutes, maybe once a day, maybe once a week. Okay. So if you need some more time, take your time in the room with the part. If you're complete, if you know what the check-in is, or if they trust the connection, they trust the connection to self. Now both of you can go outside, and if the parts on the bench didn't come with you, you can meet with those parts. How do these parts feel now that they've seen the target part heal and change? Has it changed anything? All right, so I had two parts who were totally at odds, and now they're actually sitting together really very calm. They understand each other better. Or maybe the part of you that was left on the bench needs to go in the room and get some healing, and that's okay too. Okay. So if you need a few more moments, go ahead and just finish that quietly inside of you. If that feels complete, when you're ready, just gently open your eyes. Very good timing. Yeah. Ooh, that sounds good. Yeah. Okay. Anybody feel comfortable sharing what they experienced in there? Beautiful. Okay, beautiful. Thank you. And did they feel the need to release stuff with the elements?
thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Yes, and so what, what I love about it is like, you see they have their own consciousness, they have their own wisdom, and it's like we're really just giving them the space to tap into it. When we work against them, they just kind of double down and we can't get into the wisdom. But when we just give them the space, it's like the way that you're speaking, it was so effortless. It was like, oh yeah, there's stillness in motion too. Like this is all making sense. So that's really beautiful. It felt so peaceful just hearing the whole thing. <laughs> and I love, I feel the waterfall. So thank you. How did it go? Beautiful. Yeah, thank you. And thank you for sharing that. Like it's, you know, we got to cry sometimes, you know, so it's good to have a safe space to let that out. Crying is a nervous system reset, you know, so dudes, you can do it too. You got nervous systems. <laughs> what were you going to share? And so then, did you discover something new about, or did you already know what the tears were about? Okay, okay, okay. So you had some clarity, but this allowed the emotional body to release. Okay. And what elements, you said you used water also, or no? Oh. Oh, I feel it. It feels so good. Yeah. Thank you. Did, yeah, thank you for participating. Did anybody have a part that doesn't trust the self right now? That's still not feeling secure? Yes. Ooh. Ooh. Okay. Beautiful. So thank you for sharing that because sometimes that's the boundary. And it's so, I would say the fact that you can't open it, that's probably a manager saying, not, not, not yet, not today. And as you shared, you're more of a kind of introverted, you're not a real social being. So for you to get inside that chest, you may need to do a private session, a one-on-one -on -one session with somebody you feel comfortable with. And we really want to honor that. So I'll give an example when we work with these protectors. I have a client who um, just very extreme abuse, went through the foster care system. Her biological mother actually tried to drown her when she was two years old, like really horrible stuff, right? So at this time when she, at this point in time in this story I'm going to tell, when we were working, she was staying with a friend. Um, she was homeless at the time. And um, so she would do sessions, we're doing them remotely on the phone, she would be in her car to do the sessions. So if you look at this work, like if your inner world is a house and we're going from room to room, finding the distortions and finding the parts, right? We're about to go in this room with this traumatic memory and her protector just basically was like, no, you are not opening that door, we are not doing that today, N to the O to the N to the O. So instead of being like, we're going in because I know best, because I'm the healer and I'm gonna fix you. Instead, you step back into the self. The self, I'm not in a hurry if I'm in myself. I got forever. Why do I need to bully you? So instead, get curious. So like, well, what are you afraid would happen if we go in this door today? And her protector was like, well, she has to go to work tomorrow. If we go in that door, she's going to be out of commission for at least three days. It's not happening. And like, what do I look like forcing her to do that? That's like rape. Right? And you see healers doing this, they mean well, but they're just not respecting the boundary because it's understandable. Because again, when you know that there's pain in there, you want to get into the pain body and get it out. But we have to understand sometimes the fastest way is not the fastest way because it can create backlash and repercussions and acting out, right? If you go in too far too fast and your nervous system is saying, don't open the chest today, that can cause backlash like the cutting, the drinking alcohol, the, the spacing out, the having a depressive episode. So we want to do this work without destabilizing people, right? So back to my client, the part was like, nope, you are not going in here. No, we're not negotiating, no. But you can go in that room. 
So we just went in another room and worked with another part. She did a huge unburdening. It was a beautiful ceremony. And that's still taking one notch off the depth of her pain body, reclaiming more energy into present. And then a couple weeks later, we went and worked with that big, thick memory over there that was pretty gnarly. So being gentle on ourselves, not imposing an agenda, and just listening. Your system, we know the hope chest is there. We got really good information, right? So this was a successful session because you know there's something there now. And you also know this is not the space to do it in. So you can make arrangements to get in a safe space to do that next step. So thank you for sharing that. Right, so it's really important to not feel like, oh, I didn't do it like the perfect model of this, right? Because everybody's system is going to look different. I have worked with people who they have little exiles with the worst abuse ever, and you get to the exile and you think it's going to be tears and like a 20 minute unburdening, and the exile's like, I'm ready, let's go. They don't even want to do the ceremony. There's like, no, I'm going with the unicorns on the rainbow. <laughs> and they're just done, and you think they would want to really, but that exile's like, I've been in that for 40 years, I don't need to talk about it anymore. But sometimes you get to them and they've been there for 40 years and nobody has listened and they're like, finally, I need to tell you what happened. You don't remember this, but in 1992, your uncle did this and blah, blah, blah. You know, the, the memories will come up because I do have clients who come in and they're like, I can't remember anything from age four to 12, right? So we can bring that up. And sometimes you get to the four to 12 year olds and they burst out and they want to talk, they want to be heard, they want to be respected, they want to be loved up by the self right? So everyone is different and you really can't predict. I have not seen yet a ratio of level of trauma and how easily the exile comes out. It can be so mismatched. So we just want to be respectful of every individual part, every individual person, right? Going at their pace. Because if we do it this way, we become allies with the protective system so we don't have those crazy backlashes afterwards. And this is why I caution people. I don't know if any of you have heard of EMDR. Yeah. So EMDR, it's, it goes really fast, but we want to be cautious because it can bypass the protectors. So a friend of mine, her husband is a veteran and he went and did EMDR. And it actually wasn't even combat stuff that came up. It came up that he was sexually abused by his dad and brothers, and it was totally suppressed. And he was not ready to deal with that. He just wasn't ready to deal with it. So they did this session with him. He got this memory back, and they sent him home with, like, no tools. He divorced my friend. He left them and will no longer see his children because he thinks, oh, this happened to me and I didn't remember, so what if I'm a monster and I'm going to do that to my daughter? So now he won't let his children come around him, and he has no skill set to integrate that. So those kind of tools are important to unlock things, but we want to do it in a certain order, right? We want to set this foundation where you experience for yourself, I do have a higher self and I can heal this and I can soothe my little inner children that are crying and I do know how to do this. But if that foundation isn't there and I just open up that room and <laughs> this crazy memory, you know, you're not ready. You're not ready. So the least we can do to our traumatized parts is be respectful and gentle. And in fact, going slowly is actually the fastest way to go because then we're establishing trust and the protectors know if they say no, you're going to listen. Because even though from the outside in they may look neurotic, they have their own inner logic that makes a lot of sense, right? So like a rescued dog, right? A dog that was used in fighting rings. You rescue the dog and you're like, I'm so nice, I'm so good with dogs. And you want to go pet it and you think you're going to have this nice connection and the dog rejects you. Are we going to blame the dog? Everything it's ever known is that every human hand hit it. Every other dog attacked it. We can't expect that dog to just be like, oh, I'm happy now because you said everything's going to be okay. No, we're going to work very gently, right? We're going to take baby steps. We're going to maybe sit on one side of the room and let the dog come to us, right? We're going to set up scenarios to have healing interactions and corrective emotional experiences rather than re-injuring. So that's really, you know, what this work is about. So I deeply appreciate all of you stepping into this and doing this work. It takes courage to look at our stuff. Yeah, good job, honey. Um, 
And I will be around for the next couple of days. I do have cards as well. So if anybody feels like they need some follow-up or you need private sessions, I'm, I'm here for that. Um, and I think it's time, but just briefly before I go, anybody have any other questions or anything that you want to share?